So, uh, hi everyone again. So, uh, very happy to see all of you. This is our uh, Applying Ethology Monday webinar. This is the last one of 2021, and we're really happy to have uh, Anne Marike Smith with us uh, uh, today. And Anne Marike did her PhD at the Animal Welfare Program of the University of British Columbia. Her PhD project was to investigate the preference of dairy cows for different outdoor areas. I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about this uh, later and how these influence dairy cattle behavior. Currently, she's a postdoc researcher at the University of Calgary and studying dairy farmers' perspectives on outdoor access for dairy cows, as well as the effects of various types of outdoor access on dairy cattle health. So, Anne Marie, uh, Marie uh, very happy to have you here. And then uh, you can uh, get started whenever you're ready. And uh, sorry, just before you start, so uh, just uh, when Anne Marie is speaking, please remember to keep your microphone. And and your video off so that we can have a very smooth uh, talk. And then at the end of the talk, if you have any questions, you can either put it in the chat or if you feel comfortable, your internet is good, you can also raise your hand and then we can call you and then you can ask Anne Marike uh, your questions yourself. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here and for the organizers for inviting me. Um, so, like Jen already uh, mentioned, I would like to talk to you um, about some studies that I did during my PhD and my postdoc on outdoor access for dairy cows. And it is both about the cow preference as well as on the dairy farmers uh, perspectives on this topic. So as you can see over here, there is a pasture with cows in it. It's nice weather and the cows are grazing, some are ruminating in the fields, and it looks like a very idyllic picture. And we know from research that lots of people actually, um, they think that cows, that they, they, that they um, live like that on, on um, farms. However, Many, uh, many dairy cows actually are um, housed indoors year round in, um, in freestall system, lots of them in freestall systems, so as you can see in the picture above. And the, the, the idea is, I mean, is this a problem, right? Because you, as you can see, it looks very different than maybe the idyllic picture that lots of people have in mind. But I mean, um, the, the issue is um, we know that, it, that the dairy cows live a very different life in these, in these uh, freestyle barns. However, the, the, the main question here is, is this a problem that these cows are living um, in freestyle barns year round? Well, I would say there are a few stakeholders um, that have a stake in this um, question. And one of them is of course the dairy cow. So a few years ago um, at UBC, a study was done to understand dairy cow preference for um, pasture access. And what they did was they had freestyle house dairy cows in, um, in, so in a freestyle and they had free choice access to go to pasture. So for 24 seven, I think they did it for at least six groups. Um, they allow these cows to go outdoors to pasture or remain inside the freestyle barn. So what they found was, as you can see here on the Y axis is the percentage of cows that are on pasture and on the X axis is the time of day and hour. So it, it starts at 8 a.m. and it ends at 8 a.m. the next day. So what they found was that during the day, dairy cows had actually very little interest in going to pasture. But that picture was completely flipped during the night because um, they found, found that at any time during the night, they, they, like, they found at least 90% of the dairy cows um, outdoors. So what you can take from this is that the dairy cow preference for pasture access is not very black and white. It's very, what we say, context dependent. So, if it is um, the hot summer, um, then they often like to spend time outside over in the night and not so much during the day. But when it rains during the night, they also have been found to spend more time indoors. So when the weather conditions and when the, the environmental conditions are, um, are good, they do like, they seem to like to spend some time um, outside on pasture. But it, this picture is definitely not black and white. And then there have been some studies done in, um, 
in um, different parts of the world, actually not only in Europe, but also in Brazil and in the US and Canada. And interestingly, um, it has shown that the public views outdoor access is important for animal welfare, for the dairy cows welfare. And interestingly here is outdoor access. So it was not only pasture that people emphasize. So people often actually emphasize that they think cows like to go outside. So they think it is important for these cows to go outside and to feel the sun and to have space and soft flooring to roam around in. So all these factors that people emphasize, they are not specific to pasture. They, they actually extend beyond the provision of pasture access per se. So if we know now that um, the public likes to see um, cows outside and cows have a partial preference to spend some time on pasture, what is actually currently happening in the world? Well, we do not know a lot about data on alternative outdoor areas than pasture, but we have some data available on pasture. And we know that less than 20% of the lactating dairy cows in Canada and the US have access to pasture. And we also know that in Europe, um, it very much ranges by country from as little as like 20 to 30% in Denmark to over 90% in, in Ireland. Uh, overall, this is also decreasing. And so in my PhD, what we did was we were thinking, so this is it's very important to realize here, we were not talking to farmers here, but we were thinking, well, from our perspective, with um, our, our knowledge on this, what could be possible barriers for pasture access um, for dairy farmers? Well, we thought maybe, you know, you possibly they don't have enough land around their farm or the pasture isn't close enough to the farm. There is competition with crops because it may be more economically beneficial for a farmer to grow corn, for example, on, on the land instead of providing the cows access to pasture. We could see that maybe farmers are hesitant to provide the cows pasture access because um, they are not able as well as inside to control the cows diet and they may maybe struggle with that. Um, and also we know that pasture isn't feasible in all seasons because especially during the wet seasons, if the cows go on to pasture, they can trample the grass and that can hamper the grass growth in the spring. So then we were thinking, well, what about alternative outdoor areas? So these are um, deep bedded outdoor areas with a soft flooring and the cows can move and lie in these areas unrestrictedly. Um, and they have a free choice to access these areas from the freestyle barn. And we know that these types of outdoor areas are occasionally used in, um, on commercial dairy farms, but there are a lot of unknowns. Um, and an interesting thing about these alternative outdoor areas as well is that because there is no grass growing on these, you don't have the problem with cows trampling the grass. So you can potentially keep more cows in a smaller space in these outdoor areas. Um, and you can also potentially use them uh, year round. And we were thinking, well, we know that pasture can facilitate the expression of lying and standing and estrus behaviors. So maybe you are able to obtain a few of these benefits um, on, um, on an out alternative outdoor area that you can that you are that you normally get on pasture. So what did we do? Um, we did an experiment. So this was the first experiment of my PhD to determine the preference of lactating dairy cows for pasture versus an outdoor sandbag during the night. And we provided them access to these areas only during the night, because if you remember from previous slides, especially during the night, at least in summer, cows really were interested in going to pasture, not so much during the day. So you can see here an example of what the pasture looked like. It was by design um, very large. It was over 1500 square meter per cow. And this is an example of the outdoor sand pack, so the alternative outdoor area that we used. And we, by design again, made it much smaller than the pasture. So we gave the cows 12 square meters per cow here. So 1500, over 1500 on the pasture, 12 square meters here. And we did that because we wanted to mimic the space allowances that you would typically use on commercial dairy farms if they would use a pasture or an alternative area. So what did we do? We run eight groups of 12 lactating cows. Um, and so the group was our experimental unit. 
And what did we do? Well, we 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 housed them normally, so during the day, um, and uh, we housed those cows uh, in the free stall barn. But then at night, we gave them free access from the free stall barn to an outdoor sandbag. And then another two nights, we gave them access, free access again to a pasture. And then we had three nights in which they could, from the freestyle barn, access both outdoor areas simultaneously. So what did we, we find? Um, it was actually quite interesting to see how the cows picked it up so fast that once we opened the door at 8 p.m. at night, um, that they could go outside. Like they sometimes were already even lined up, which was interesting. So you can see over here on the left lower corner, you can see me open the gates in a few seconds and just observe the cows, they're ruminating and they're just chilling in their, in their beds. And then once the gate opens, um, I mean, of course this video is sped up, but in real life, this took about 45 seconds for, for me to open the gates to most of the cows um, leaving the pen to go outside. And so based on this, um, you can tell there was quite some interest of these cows to go outside. And it also obviously translated into the results. So what we found was in the two options phase. So it was always at, from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So during those 12 hours, the cows could choose themselves where they wanted to be. So did they want to remain in the freestyle barn or did they want to go to pasture or did they... Um, want to go to the sandbag. So within those 12 hours, they could decide how they wanted to spend their night and they could always go from one area to the other. So if both outdoor options, so both the outdoor sandbag and the pasture were available, the cows chose to spend 90% of the night on the pasture, 1% in the, free, in the, sorry, in the outdoor sandbag and the remaining 9% in the freestyle barn. So you can see here that when both outdoor areas were available, the cows had a very strong preference for pasture over the sand pack. Then we had a one option phase. Um, so that was again during those 12 hours. And that meant now they can only choose between one outdoor area and the freestyle. So in this case, the pasture, they, can, they had 12 hours to freely access the pasture from the freestyle barn. And then again, we found more or less 90% of the night they wanted to be, they were on pasture and the remaining 10%, they were in the freestyle barn. But then what we were very interested in is what would they do when their favorite outdoor option, so the pasture was not available, but only the sand pack was available. So then the cows chose to spend about 44% of the night outside. So we concluded from this experiment that cows had a preference for pasture over an outdoor sand pack during the night, but that if only they were allowed access to an outdoor sand pack, that they still spent about half of the night outside. So with this, these results in mind, we decided to continue on this same track of looking at, okay, what are these cows preference for alternative outdoor areas? Um, and we decided to use now a different um, uh, outdoor area. So we, instead of sand, we used a wood chip pack because we noticed from the previous experiment that the sand could get quite wet. So we thought maybe we can make it even more attractive by using a, a different substance. And we also wanted to look at what their preference was not only during the summer, but during um, the winter as well. So we wanted to determine in this experiment the preference of lactating dairy cows for an outdoor wood chip pack versus the freestyle barn during the summer and in the winter. And in this experiment, we also allowed the cows 24 seven um, outdoor access. So not only the nights, but we wanted to see what they would do when they would be given free access uh, for the whole 24 hours. So this is a kind of a close up on the outdoor wood chip pack. Um, we run uh, eight groups of 12 lactating cows in the summer and eight groups of 12 lactating cows in the winter. So again, group was our experimental unit. And what we found was, so again, on the Y axis is the time on the outdoor pack and on the X axis is the time in hour of day. So it starts now, not at 8 a.m., but at midnight and it ends at midnight the next day. And this is in the summer. So they spend an average 25% of their time. So over the 24 hours um, 
on that outdoor pack. Interestingly, again, um, you can see that they had a much stronger preference for um, access to this outdoor pack during the night compared to during the day. Now, interestingly, um, the winter, they spent an average 2% of their time outside, um, and there was no difference in their preference to be outside in this outdoor pack during um, day or night. Um, I do have to say that this winter was an exceptionally cold winter for the part of Canada, even for Canada. Um, there, we, we were in a quite a mild, um, area and there, this was quite a harsh winter and we even had to stop the experiments um, for a few weeks because we just couldn't possibly keep the barn doors open that that would be too bad for the cow's welfare um, so it would be interesting to see if um, what the, the results would look like when we would do this over multiple seasons um, because this was not a quite unquote unquote normal winter for that part of Canada so what we concluded from this experiment was that cows had a partial preference to access an outdoor wood chip pack, and especially this preference was um, existed during the summer nights. So now I wanted to switch gears a little bit because we have now talked about um, the dairy cow preference for outdoor access for pasture, but alternative areas as well. And now we know a little bit more about that. I started my postdoc and uh, we decided that it was quite interesting that we know quite a bit about the cow preference for outdoor access. We know a lot also about the public perception of outdoor access for dairy cows, but we, at least here in Canada and the US, we don't really know that much um, about the dairy cow, or sorry, the dairy farmer perspective on outdoor access. So I switched, um, to a new area for me, which is social science. So to better understand the dairy farmers' perspectives on, on outdoor access. And um, interestingly, um, this, this data is very, so these experiments are very different. So I did very quantitative experiments in my PhD and now my postdoc, uh, very much um, just qualitative um, studies I've done so far. So just keep that in mind. There will not be your, really any numbers in here, just the, the data will be mainly words. So we're very much switching gears here. So the aim of uh, my first study in my, of my P, or sorry, of my postdoc was to understand Western Canadian dairy farmer views on outdoor access for dairy cows. So what did we do? Well, we used um, 11 focus groups, three were face-to-face -face and eight were via Zoom because literally um, I did the third focus group at the, and, and then the announcement was made that the pandemic was shutting the whole world down. But um, the, the Zoom focus groups worked really well as well. We had 50, involved 56 Western Canadian dairy producers recruited through snowball sampling we had between three to six participants per focus group, and we had mixed groups. So that means that within a group, um, we always had at least one person that did not provide outdoor access and a person that did provide outdoor access. So there was always, it was always mixed. And I just wanted to emphasize here that the main idea of this study was to get an understanding of the why question. So why do Western Canadian dairy farmers provide outdoor access and why don't they do that? Um, so this has nothing really to do with being representative or anything. We we had like we used, as you can see, a convenience sample of 56 Western Canadian dairy producers. And um, the aim was not to get a representative sample, but to really get a detailed understanding of these farmers' um, IDs around outdoor access for dairy cows. So the data were the transcripts, so the, the typed out um, text spoken during the interviews, and I, and I analyzed that data, so these, these spoken words using template analysis. So what do you do with template analysis? Well, you start familiarize, familiarizing yourself with the data. Um, because template analysis is a way to analyze that qualitative data, so to analyze the spoken words. And it um, uses a hierarchical structure, or sorry, a hierarchical coding, which provides then structure to the data. So after familiarizing yourself with the data, you kind of start preliminary coding. And what you do then is you organize your data. So you look at the cluster, you get clusters of words or sentences that have a common topic. So you can see a cluster origin originating here, and there is one here. 
So these, these clusters of similar topics can also be called teams. And using these themes, you kind of use, use these themes and subteams to produce an, a template um, and to develop a template. And that template, which you can see over here, really is the basis, forms the basis of your results. So you can see here in this template, it's very much um, the hierarchical structure you can see. So you start with the main team that branches out to five sub themes and those branch out to more sub themes as well. So just an example, someone, this is a quote from, the, from one of the participants. And a person says there was less digital dermatitis, less lameness in the sense of strawberry food rot. They are dirty, like their udders are dragging in mud depending on what time of year it is. So then the first part of that sentence, when I would code that, I would be like, okay, for that person, this, this goes under a reason to provide the cow's outdoor access with the subteam cow welfare under the subteam health. So you can see here, okay, that person was talking for reasons to provide outdoor access under cow welfare, um, talking about um, cow health. So that is basically how you develop that template. So you can imagine that while you're coding your data, you do build this template and um, you very much go back and forth about it uh, until you have a template that you feel like, yeah, this is very much the basis of my results. And then um, you can start writing up your data. So we had 56 dairy farmers, 87% of these were male and they were on average 44 years, um, range between 23 and 65 years. We have an average herd size represented of 203 lactating cows, but ranged considerably between 60 and 1250, a uh, median of 160. And interestingly, I mean, the number of participants, although we use snowball sampling, we did look a little bit into are these what what are what is the percentage of these participants that provide outdoor access and that seems to be seem to be more or less comparable with the numbers that are available um, for this part of Canada. So what did we find? Well, we found that when you ask farmers, so what do you think, Western Canadian dairy farmers, at least, what do you think about outdoor access? So not specifically pasture, but what do you think about outdoor access for dairy cows? Why do you provide it or why don't you provide it? Um, they, the, the answers could be grouped into five main themes. So these revolved around cow welfare, management, economics, infrastructure, and climate. So these five themes represented both themes for people that provided outdoor access, reasons to provide outdoor access, as well as reasons not to provide cows outdoor access. I do not have time to go into all of these five in detail. I will go a little bit into more detail on cow welfare and management, but let me explain climate infrastructure and economics um, just shortly. So climate very much revolved around, well, is the area that I'm living in, is it conducive or not for outdoor access for cows? With regard to infrastructure, is the farm set up for easy outdoor access or not? And with regard to economics, especially farmers that did not provide outdoor access, especially pasture access, they said, well, we're too afraid to lose on milk production and butterfat production. Uh, and that's the main, the main, yeah, two factors that they're being paid uh, on. Um, some farmers did provide outdoor access for economic reasons, and that were especially the organic producers who get uh, paid a little bit more um, because they provide the cows uh, pasture access. So for them, it was actually an incentive. It was interesting economically to provide pasture access because of that reason. So diving a little bit more into cow welfare, um, overall, when people said, well, we don't provide cows with outdoor access because we do not think it is uh, great for their welfare or it's not like positive for their welfare, they said mainly, well, we because we have health concerns, especially around other health, you know, is outdoor access going to lead to more other problems? They said, well, cows do not have a preference uh, to go outdoors anymore because our modern freestyle barns, they are well set up for, um, for the cows and the cows do not really want to go outside anymore. And it's easier for us to take care of our cows inside the barn because we can provide the cows with a more consistent environment, a better routine, which they thrive in. And we can also much better meet their nutritional needs with the, the um, ration, the, the feed ration that they can very much fine tune towards the cow's needs. And they thought that was much better 
uh, that they were much better able to, to meet the cow's nutritional needs indoors with the total mixed ration compared to letting the cows out on pasture. People that did provide outdoor access said, well, I do it because of health reasons, uh, especially uh, again, it was thought to be very good against lameness. So to provide cows access to pasture or, or soft flooring, uh, alternative outdoor areas. Uh, they said, my cows really prefer to go outside. Uh, it's good for their natural behavior. They can express grazing behavior, for example. We think that is good. And they also said the quality of the outdoor environment we think is much better than um, the quality of the indoor environment. So here I will, I will show you a few quotes um, to indicate um, what the farmers um, thought about around these issues. So the green farmer will be the farmer that provides outdoor access or that, says a re that has a reason why he or she thinks outdoor access um, is, is good for cow welfare. And the, the red one indicates a reason why, um, of why cow outdoor access is not good for cow welfare. So someone said, well, they benefit not just regarding their feet and their legs, but pasture access also improves longevity. And someone else said, I'm not convinced that a cow would last longer in a pasture versus inside a well-developed barn. Someone else said, well, they got the benefits of the fans and the misters and everything else that keeps them cool. We have sand bedding. I think they're just as comfortable inside as they are outside. So again, emphasizing the modern freestyle barns that provide a really good environment uh, for the cows. Someone else said, oh yeah, there's challenges that you don't get in that controlled indoor environments, but they love going outside. Someone else said, well, especially during the lactation, they like the routine. And another person that interestingly did not provide outdoor access, but he said, if you've ever seen a cow run on concrete versus on grass, it's two different things. If you really truly want to commit to doing the best thing for those animals, then there should be an aspect of outdoor pasturing because in my opinion, they are not being allowed to fully express their behavior inside the barn. So very interesting um, perspectives on, on cow welfare. So every th everyone thought cow welfare was important, but how they thought that would be best met um, was different. So some people were convinced it's much better inside, other people were th thought it's much better outside. Then going to management, the people that the, the participants that kept the cows indoors or that, that, that more emphasized that they liked that system, they said it's easier to manage my cows inside, um, especially with larger herd sizes. Nobody really said, said a specific herd size, but overall they said bigger herd sizes um, it's hard, much harder to manage when you have the cows outside. Uh, it's easier for us to, to provide the cows a consistent environments. We can control everything in the barn and we can control everything much better. So again, like the, the feed ration came up um, as we already thought. Um, it's easier. To, so overall, they thought they had more control, it's easier to manage. And they also said, well, we know everything about these indoor systems, but we lack knowledge on outdoor systems that was also seen as a barrier to provide the cows outside access. The people that provided some form of outdoor access often said, well, for me, it's easier. So interestingly for everyone, it's easy, ease of management is important, but what that means is different by farm and by farmer. So they said, well, it's much easier to provide my cows outdoor access. Um, we have a smaller herd size. Again, no real numbers were men mentioned, but smaller herd size, people said, well, it's easier to manage my, uh, my, my um, uh, outdoor access area. And a lot of people said, well, we have the knowledge and the experience um, to make outdoor access successful. Another few quotes again to illustrate these results. Uh, someone said, well, we used to do it, so giving outdoor access when our farm was smaller. Someone else said, well, when herds are getting larger like ours, we are over 325 cows. It's pretty difficult to pasture. Someone else said, well, you can spend more time outside. You can move gates, you can go for walks. You're not stuck in a loader, so it's a tractor, making feet as long in the summer. And that's also a pretty nice thing. So again, going back to that ease of management, someone else said, conventional farming has found a way to have healthy animals and managed well without having the extra management of outdoor access. 
Another person said, well, when you know that the, they are, so the lactating in cows are in the barn, it is just one less worry. And summers are so busy already that it's just easier to manage when they are inside. Interestingly, so this person is specifically talking about the lactating cows, but a little bit later, the same person said, well, outdoor access can save you work with dry cows and heifers because you don't have to scrape the barn. You just have to have somebody check them once a day. So overall, we found that the decision to provide outdoor access involved the weighing of a, a variety of these farm specific factors. And they, they mainly revolved around the climate, animal welfare, management, economics, and infrastructure. So the take home messages of this whole presentation, I guess, would be that we found that dairy cows have a partial preference for outdoor access because they spend nine, about 90% of the night on pasture and about half of the night on alternative outdoor areas. And we also know that we found that at least here in Western Canada, the dairy farmers decision to provide outdoor access involves the weighing of a multitude of farm specific factors. And because of that, um, it's hard to make general recommendations uh, for outdoor access um, because it very much depends on the individual farm and farmer situation if outdoor access would be a success uh, on the farms as far as we have uh, seen. So with that, I would really like to thank our sponsors um, for supporting our work and um, you for your attention. And I would be um, really happy to, uh, to take any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, and uh, Marike. It's, it's a really rich talk, like very engaging and so informative. I learned, I really learned a lot from both the experimental part you did with uh, with the cows and also the farmers' perspective. Really, really great. We already have a, a lot of questions uh, from the audience, so I'm gonna just go uh, with the first one is from Tom. Uh, he was asking, did you collect any environmental data in the summer to assess the risk of heat stress affecting lion behaviors? Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah. I'm happy with that question. I think there will be more questions that I can attest to. So, yeah, we did look at that. However, you know, I didn't, I couldn't talk about everything here. But yeah, we did look at um, environmental conditions. So like temperature humidity index. So a combination between like the temp air temperature and the humidity. Um, we looked at that. Um, we also look at rainfall and, and wind speed and all of that. And um, overall, it was we could the the heat stress part is very interesting. But we had um, when the during the summer when we had them outside when we gave the cows outdoor access during the day as well to that wood chip pack, um, they spent three percent of the time outside during the day and the and fifty percent of the night they spent uh, outdoors. So. That was the 25% was overall, but there was almost no interest there. It was like the odd cow that went outside um, during the day. So we couldn't even really measure any effects of heat stress because they just chose to be in, remaining in the barn and not even lie outside when it was that warm. Okay, thanks. So Jeremy was asking, does stage of lactation influence the amount of time spent outside? And what did the variation between individual cows look like? Do you find certain individuals like to spend a lot of time out and others want to stay in? Right, okay, very interesting question. We did not have the experimental design to look at that because we only um, allowed the cows, well, ranging between different experiments, but between uh, a week and two weeks um, of outdoor access that we base the data on. So I wouldn't know anything based on the data that I have. I cannot say anything about um, yeah, if, if lactation influences it. However, there have been some studies done in the UK like Charlton um, at all 2011 and 2013 that, that looked at this. And it, it looks like that at least in some of the studies that have been conducted around this, um, lactation st status does play a role, either in those studies or, or from, from other authors. Um, and um, to just, yeah, I, I mean, the individual variation between cows, I, I can say something about that, but I would just want to emphasize that it is still like, I mean, we didn't, again, right, design the experiment to really look at that. Um, but I do, of course, have the individual uh, cow data, and there was um, um, 
definitely variation between the cows because if you look at whatever the um, the three percent uh, of time spent outdoors um, during the summer with the wood chip pack that was I mean some cows never like they went outside once and then remained indoors um, but that three percent was really made up of a few cows spending well considerable amount of time outside and so in that sense, there is definitely some some variation, and I and this is this is a very anecdotal one thing, but that kind of kept us thinking like maybe we should look a little bit more into that. Hasn't happened so far, but what does the freestyle? I mean, the freestyles are all made for you know it's all one size. However, for outdoors, anyone can just lie in the pack um, if it's at least big enough um, unrestrictedly. And we had one cow that we just knew she had two or three lying bouts per day, um, because she just struggled so much with getting up and down in the freestyles. And, and she was the one who made up a considerable amount of time of that 3%. So I, based on that, I would say there's merit into looking at individual variation and because it, it may as well be that some cows are also more vulnerable being in the outdoor area, right? So that they may elect to actually remain inside the freestyle barn because they have more protection over there. Because in another st study, we looked at uh, agonistic interactions and they were definitely quite high on the pack, yeah. Yeah, definitely an important point to look mm -hmm. into for further. Uh, so the next question is from Ella. Uh, hi, this might be a really stupid question. There's no stupid question. And uh, apologies if you've already mentioned this, but what about the grass itself as an influential factor in cow choice for wood chips versus pasture? Did you control for food preference in some way? I uh, should really enjoy your talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, May, no, that's a very good question. Um, I didn't mention that, but we did look at uh, feeding time. Um, in that, in, in, on, in all experiments, and overall, um, there was no or very little difference over the different experiments in terms of in terms of feeding time. So, when the cows who, who had access to um, to the um, uh, pasture um, area versus they only had access to the outdoor area, which they, I mean, in, in the outdoor sand pack, they couldn't really graze. Um, there was a slight difference in feeding time, but I mean, this is honestly, this is like five years ago. Um, I don't know how many minutes it was, but I remember it was biologically quite, um, yeah, it was, I, I don't want to say a number, but I remember that it was biologically quite, there was a difference, but not very meaningful when you look at really um, how many minutes it, it were. And the Legrand study that I showed in the beginning with that graph on pasture that they like to be outside more during the night and during the day, they looked at dry matter intake. And interestingly, what they found was that cows spent um, less time eating when they could go to pasture, but, but they did not very much decrease their dry matter intake. It only dropped, I think, by one and a half kilograms. Um, when they could go to pasture, but they they ate faster, so they sped up their 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 feeding um, their 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 intake their um, feed feed rate intake um, to to compensate kind of for um, any um, yeah any losses. Oh, wait, how am I going to explain this better? Um, when the cows could go to pasture, they would still eat ninety percent of their TMR. So what, what farmers really like to see that the cows are eating because that is, an, an, yeah, they, there's a lot of energy and, and everything in that, in that feed. Um, when, when cows would go, we have access to pasture, they would speed up eating that dry matter from the, the, the total mixed range ration. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to get too technical, but basically there was no real concern um, on um, how much those cows lost in terms of um, feed intake in the barn, especially because they sped up their feed intake rate. So based on that, we did look at feeding time, uh, but not feed intake. And again, we, we concluded overall that there was not that much um, concern at least not what we think in terms of cows really decreasing their dry matter intake inside the barn. So on the TMR a lot when you provide them 
pasture or alternative outdoor areas, access to outdoor areas, yeah. So, so basically they didn't, they didn't go outdoor uh, just because they want to eat, they're hungry or they already yeah. had their intake, they, they yeah. want the access to yeah. the outdoor pasture, okay. Yeah, yeah sorry, sure. because in, in, we always had ad libitum TMR, so feed inside the barn, that's good to clarify, and they could choose to go outside and obviously on the pasture, yeah, we kind of called it the ice cream stomach, they would, uh, we would see them graze, but it really didn't decrease their their feeding time in the barn by much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, another question from Lana: Does the Canadian code uh, regarding organic dairies require access to pasture like the organic rules do in the United States? Yeah. Good question. They do. Um, I think. Um, I don't think they have changed these, they re revised those codes um, since I last read them. And the, the specifics are that the cows have to graze one third of their dry matter intake um, on organic farms. Grass fat, that's a different um, issue because I know that in BC, you can have you can label your 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 milk as being grass fed, but the cows literally are being fed grass in the barn, and I don't think they have any requirements that they have to. I'm pretty sure they don't have any requirements. The cows actually have to go to the pasture. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the same in in the states as well. They have the grass fed uh, label as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question from Catalina. Uh, thank you for the lovely talk. Please, could you elaborate more on research findings on health and longevity of dairy cows with access to pasture? What health issues can pasture reduce or increase? And what about effects of access to pasture on performance, for example, body weight or milk yield? Right. Yeah, very good question once again. However, unfortunately, I have to say that we did not look into any of that because our experiments were, were very much based to understand the cow preferences. So very much like um, running multiple groups for a few weeks to understand what do these cows think about the option of going outside. And now we know, okay, they, they like it to a certain extent. Um, now I think is the time to ask those kinds of questions of, okay, what are the implications or what are the, the effects on key health outcomes of providing cows uh, access to whatever, like a, a straw pack or a dirt lot or whatever. And actually we are planning to start next year with a field study um, that's very much like a more epidemiological um, oriented study. So going to 120 dairy farms, 40 with, um, for lactating cows, 40 with um, pasture access, 40 as a control and treat in um, free stalls and 40 on alternative outdoor areas, probably dirt lots or straw yards. Um, and looking at the lactating cows, but also at um, the same treatments in, in young stock as well as dry cows, because, and I didn't really talk about that much, but um, farmers did say that for them, especially regarding the young stock and the dry cows, it's easier for them to provide them outdoor access. However, they don't know what it will do to the health of the cows. And to them, they said it's a main, main barrier for us. And we're hesitant to just try it out. So they literally kind of suggested in these focus groups, Amrika, start, start studying that. Uh, and we will, you know, maybe revise our practices here. So then we got a grant to a bounce that is funded by, by the dairy farmers, which I think is really cool, um, to, to understand these effects better. There is some research on pasture um, and the implications of that on health, but not that much on um, alternative areas, especially not alternative areas, yeah. Okay, thanks. And Jillian is asking, thanks for the presentation. Were there equal amounts of responses from the focus groups that were opposed to uh, versus in favor of pasture access? Or was one of these opinions more common? Yeah, so we did not look at any type of prevalence data here because our study involved 56 Western Canadian dairy farmers and they were picked in like a convenience way, right? So there was nothing that we aimed to in our study to really um, look at any representativeness. 
So I would be really hesitant to be like, we never asked them, okay, are you in favor or not? So I cannot give you any, any percentages. However, if you also, if you read the paper, you will see that um, I would say two thirds of the, the, yeah, the, the results encompass reasons not to provide outdoor access. One third of this study of the results of the time, or not the time necessarily, but the, the things that people said, um, like they really um, were related to reasons to provide outdoor access. So you could see there were more reasons and probably if you would time it, there's definitely dare to say that people talk more about why they didn't provide outdoor access than why they didn't. Um, and that also is kind of in line with what we've found. There is more farmers that did not provide outdoor access, especially not to the lactate ink house than, than the rest. So naturally you start talking more about why you don't do it than why you do it. Um, but actually we're currently um, analyzing data um, to in, in which we have asked um, the yeah, Canadian dairy farmers in, through a survey, a nationally uh, spread survey, um, an online survey, what they think about those five themes that we identified. Um, and that way we can see, okay, what is actually, you know, how many people do provide outdoor access, how many people do not provide outdoor access, but also how many people do provide alternative types of outdoor areas. And what do they think about these reasons that we found in our focus group study to really understand how prevalent are these five themes in the broader Canadian dairy population? Cool, thanks. Uh, Joanna wants to ask the question about your PSC parcel. Are there any research of outdoor preference for heifers and dry cows? Yeah, once again, a good question. Um, I didn't do that, but there is some literature available um, on heifer preferences um, on, an, on a wood chip pack. Um, but dry cows have also, as far as I know, not often been used. It's often being with the lactating cows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jaden uh, wants to thank you for the talk. Fascinating material from the producers. Two questions about the cow preference experiment. Did any of the cows have previous pasture experience, perhaps as heifers? And are you aware of studies where shade was also provided outdoors? Right, yeah, so good question. I did provide the, all the cows with um, some experience days right before the experiment started. So um, most of those cows, I mean, they were all lactating cows. So they, um, they, they had all or been, of course, heifers or had already had a few dry periods. And um, many had, in, at least in, in, their, in their time as young stock and some in the dry periods, um, they had been on pasture for a few months. Most of them, not all, but most of them. And um, right before the experiment started, as I said, I provided them with at least one full day and sometimes two days of experience time and in which I would actually actively move them outdoors. If they, you know, I came in on five times during the day. So also during the night. And if I saw cows indoors, I would just put them outside just for them to, you know, have that walk, get the experience of walking outside because they had often been at least for a year in, inside, right? So you... Yeah, we waited with getting the data until there was some kind of a routine and that, that was at least two days. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. the next question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, what was that about uh, again? Are, are you aware of studies where shade oh, yeah. was also provided outdoors? Yeah, so um, in terms of the preference studies, um, I don't know because this is data that I did that I worked with five years ago. So I, if there has any anything been published, maybe in the last year that could be possible. But I do know that they did some studies on um, different types of uh, shade, and that they they found and that kind of resonated with our with our studies is that solar radiation, the 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 shades that that block the solar radiation best is the ones that cow like the, cows like the most. And that makes sense because in when it was more overcast weather, we saw more cows outdoors, but definitely during the summers. And it was always like big, big, solar, like strong solar radiation. There was so little, um, pre, yeah, there was so little interest of these cows to go outside. And that had probably a lot to do with the solar radiation because we didn't provide them any um, shade. 
And Sean is asking, thank you for the great talk again. What do you think might explain the cow's general preference for pasture over the mm -hmm. outdoor, I, I think she means the alternative outdoor access areas that you provided? Yeah, interesting question. I love that question um, it, because, you know, I we did this study knowing that we would um, find the preference of dairy cows for these out types of outdoor access, but we wouldn't really know anything about why they like it better. So we really need a whole series of experiments to tease these effects out. Um, from what I have, I mean, we also did another study to see how space, uh, different types of space allowances would influence the dairy cows um, preference to being outdoors. It did influence them during the night, not so much during the day again, because they didn't spend that much time out during the day. Um, so I would say, I mean, if I would design an experiment to tease these effects out, I would definitely say I had probably to do something with um, the, the space allowance potentially. So I would look into that. But also I think really that's something that really intrigues me is to understand um, how important is grass versus grazing for these cows? Because that is something, I mean, that definitely has, they had all the opportunity to engage in that natural behavior on the pasture, but none on the outdoor pack. So if that is something that is important for them, um, that would definitely, I think we would have to reconsider using these alternative outdoor areas, but it's um, definitely not something that we don't know enough about yet. Um, about the act of grazing, but that is, I think, space and, and um, yeah, being able to graze outdoors, I think, are two main factors here. Yeah, I was just wondering about that, because I know that you deliberately designed the experiment to kind of mimic what will happen on the commercial farm. So if they have pasture, they have a large space, but then the alternative outdoor access is, is relatively smaller. So did you actually observe some kind of, you know, competition for, for space, uh, you know, in the alternative outdoor access, uh, maybe due to the hierarchy or things like that? Yeah, so we did do a study um, after actually the, the wood chip study in which we gave cows different areas, different sizes um, of the outdoor pack, as little as four square meters per cow to 16 square meter per cow. And um, they, they did spend more time outside when they did have more space outdoors, but that was only that effect was only present at night and not during the day. Um, and then we also looked at... Um, um, at the sorry at the at the interactions between them and um, um there's a long time ago to study i'm sorry um what we found again i think yeah during the the day there was not really an effect of that but at night um smaller areas more competition but it was interesting because it looked like um, sorry, there was no there was no difference in competition, but there was less time spent outside. So it was almost as if cows were like, okay, you know, I they checked it out. They were like, there's not a lot of space. Um, I can go inside and therefore avoid being bullied. So I think that actually kind of I didn't really talk about that, but I think the agency giving the animal control about where it wants to be could be very important here because. As, as someone also said, I think it was Jeremy about, well, how important is it that, you know, different, um, different, different space allowances, but also, um, yeah, do cows want to be, what is individual variation, right? So maybe some cows in an ideal world, they would be outside by themselves or with one friend, but because it's so busy and they are not that brave, they rather stay indoors so they don't have to fight about that so in that sense just keeping them on an outdoor area just because it's an outdoor area i think is not necessarily the way to go yeah yeah thanks thanks uh really and thanks thanks for the audience so so many questions if you still have questions yeah you still have some time to put in the chat i'm i'm just gonna ask one of my i also have some questions so actually i find it really interesting that in the farmers interview they 
some of the things like from the one that provide and not provide they kind of converge they are also talking about same things do you see it as kind of a, a conflict there that they're actually caring about the same thing but they're coming yeah. from completely different ends or do you actually see as a benefit like a convergence of interests that you can use that to persuade the ones that don't want to provide access mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think it's a cool observation that we had there um, that, for example, management was ease of management is important for everyone, like who wants to make it harder for themselves to work on a farm. But what that looked like was definitely different by farm. And um, another of such examples would be that some farmers said, well, we had outdoor access, but it was because we had a really crappy barn. And we had to, you know, now we built this amazing new freestyle barn. It's so, it's so amazing. Like, the cows, I'm pretty sure if you put the, open the door, right, they won't go outside. So I think it's very important, like, yeah, I mean, we we know from the cow literature that the cow preference, yes, there is something definitely to say for outdoor access can increase um, animal welfare. However, it needs to be managed well as well. And I think just necessarily persuading farmers to do that, whereas they don't see the benefits, would not necessarily be the way to go. Um, but I think it was interesting to hear in one group the same, same the, yeah, the same um, teams come up from very different views. And um, I would just say rather than just being like, oh, you know, we we need to provide the cows with outdoor access, because I, I also think if it's not managed well, it's probably better off for a cow, although she may want to go outdoors from what we've seen from the studies to just remain indoors, because if it's just a mud pile, um, yeah, a mud, 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 muddy outside, right? Um, then it can be even detrimental for cows to provide them with outdoor access. So I think it's important to provide the right type of information, uh, good, you know, good scientific information to farmers. So and then to let them, um, yeah, instead of put, putting restrictions on them or putting legislation to to show them the real real world data and let them decide if they wanted to do that. Um, rather than you know a blanket uh, approach of everyone needs to do that um because i would be afraid that when because that's we had another part of the study which which was more about the beliefs and the, and the the values of the dairy farmers and we found that of course the mindset and the beliefs and values of farmers are very important in this in this question of do you provide outdoor area outdoor access or not and if it's, it's very much true that people say well if i don't believe in it you can give me a lot of money, but I don't want to do it. So I think when when you really, when they are interested in it, give them the right type of information and they can decide it themselves. Um, but don't, I don't think forcing people to do that would probably be more detrimental for the cow's welfare in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. And I feel that we can you know, there's so many things we can still, you know, discuss and talk about, but then uh, it's amazing that we're coming to the end of an hour. So thank you so much uh, again, and uh, Marike for wonderful talk. And uh, thanks to all the audience for the engagement and the questions. And we're really, really happy to have you as, you know, the last uh, big uh, webinar of this year. So yeah, thank, thanks everyone again for participating. So our next webinar will be uh, 10th of January, 2020. And it will be Andrea will talk about uh, head tilting in dogs, very different topic, but uh, surely as interesting uh, as uh, Anna Marikas. So thanks everyone again for your participation. And then, yeah, please come to Slack and uh, continue our discussion, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the future. And then, yeah, thanks Anna Marike again for your talk. Thanks everyone. Thank you for having me. It was nice. Thank you. Thanks.